Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Good morning. Uh, my name is Timothy Hiller. I'm a PhD candidate here, and it's my honor to introduce Miriam Renault. Miriam Renault is a PhD candidate in theology at the University of Chicago Divinity School. Her research integrates two disciplines, constructive philosophical theology and theological ethics as they relate to the question of God. More specifically, she studies the constructive theological method of Gordon Kaufman and the global ethic drafted by Hans Kung and ratified by the 1993 Parliament of the World Religions. She's especially interested in developing a form of ethical religion that is appropriate for our global age and able to speak to religious and non-religious people about their shared moral responsibility. Miriam was a junior fellow in the Martin Marty Center in 2012-2013. During that same academic year, she was a lecturer in theology at Meadfield Lombard Theological School. Miriam was the first recipient of the Divinity School's Langdon Gilkey Scholarship in 2006 and was awarded the scholarship again in 2009. She was also selected as a doctoral student member of a doctoral MDiv student team for the Theologians in Residence program sponsored by the Divinity School's Border Crossing Project. An ordained Unitarian Universalist minister, Miriam is committed to serving as a bridge between the academy and lay religionists. To this end, she blogs from a progressive, non-sectarian perspective about the ways in which religion, uh, the ways in which religious thinkers, past and present, shed light on today's issues and problems. Recordings of her blog posts and sermons have been featured on Chicago's WCPT radio program, for Food for the Soul. She's also a regular contributor of the theology columns of UU World, a quarterly magazine sent to over 120,000 Unitarian Universalist households. For the past year, Miriam has served as a managing editor of Sightings, a twice-weekly online publication sponsored by the Divinity School's Martin Marty Center for the, study, for the Advanced Study of Religion, and has contributed to Sightings herself. Sightings publishes uh, 500 to 750 word pieces that cite religion and current events and offer an informed analysis. Without further ado, I welcome Miriam. Good morning. With a change of weather, I'm feeling my allergies um, acting up, and so my voice is rather gravelly, but I'll try to push through and, uh, and uh, get through this talk. Um, so in my talk today, I focus on concepts of God and on the question of how to ascertain whether these concepts are validly moral in our age of globalization and contingency. So this is how I'm going to proceed. I have six sections, basically. First, I will explain what I mean by concepts of God. Second, I will briefly discuss the theological method of Gordon Kaufman, a method designed to construct moral concepts of God that orient us towards human flourishing. Third, I argue for the important role of ethics for identifying validly moral concepts of God and for correcting those that are not. Fourth, I argue that in this age of globalization, a global ethic is needed to test concepts of God and explain why the 1993 Parliament of the World Religions uh, Declaration Toward a Global Ethic is a strong candidate for that global ethic. Fifth, I describe the goal value norms used by the UN Development Agency to measure human flourishing. And I cross-check the Parliament's global ethic against the UNDP or the UN Development Program's empirically-based met metrics. Finally, I offer some concluding remarks about why we can have confidence in the Parliament's global ethic to ascertain whether concepts of God are validly moral and conducive to human flourishing. Section one, then, what do I mean by concepts of God? I take seriously claims such as Immanuel Kant's that God's existence can be neither proven nor disproven. As a result, I maintain an agnostic stance on the question of God's objective reality. I assume that when we speak of God, we are speaking of concepts of God, 
which for theists have subjective reality. My, present uh, my presentation today then focuses on subjective concepts of God. Now, not everyone is familiar with Kant's critique of philosophical proofs of God's existence. However, given the pluralistic, globalized world in which we live today, our constant exposure to diverse, vibrant, and compelling beliefs about God serves as a reminder that our personal beliefs, as well as those of our religious communities, constitute but one set of possible beliefs among many live options. Sociologist of religion, Hans Joas, argues that what is unique about the 21st century is not religious pluralism, because he thinks that's actually been a constant feature of European religious history. He thinks that what is unique about the 21st century is contingency. The term contingency, as used by Joas, covers the experience of our own freedom of decision and action and its consequences. Thus, to the degree that we are aware of the subjective nature of our concepts of God and of the freedom we exercise in constructing these concepts, we hold them dear with contingent certainty, a phrase coined by Yoas to mean a certainty felt in full awareness of its contingent foundations. The American philosophical theologian Gordon Kaufman understood that for some, God talk has become suspect. Still, he concluded that despite his growing difficulties with the notion of God, and despite widespread claims that God is dead, God, in fact, remains the most profound symbol in our culture. And he was talking about American culture, I believe. According to Kaufman, the word God is typically taken to stand for or name the ultimate point of reference or orientation for all life, action, devotion, reflection. Believing in, believing in God, he argued, means practically to order all of life and experience in personalistic, pur purposeful, moral terms. The upshot then for theists is that the concept of God is an ultimate reference point orienting us in life, has a capacity to significantly impact the moral dimension of our lives. The problem is if our subjective concepts of God orient our lives, how can we tell whether these concepts are orienting us toward a, towards validly moral lives? A reasonable assumption is that if is that validly moral concepts of God will orient us towards validly moral lives. But that raises another problem, which is how can we identify which concepts of God count as validly moral? And this is basically the problem I will be addressing in this paper. All right, so here's the central question of my paper. Section two. So now I'm going to briefly discuss the theological method of Gordon Kaufman, a method designed to construct validly moral concepts of God. Kaufman focused on the concept of God during the entirety of his academic, of his academic career. Some of his views about God changed significantly over the course of that long career, but today I'm going to focus on the phase of Kaufman's work that begins with the publication of God the Problem in 1972 and ends with In Face of Mystery in 1993. During this phase, Kaufman assumes that the God of whom we speak is a contingent, human-constructed concept. For Kaufman, theology is and has always been essentially an activity of imaginative construction. He calls a constructed God the available God in contrast to the actual God of whom he writes, we can have no definitive knowledge and who thus remains a mystery. Though imaginatively constructed, Kaufman insists that our available concepts of God can and do play a central role in our lives. 
Indeed, the available God provides us with an ultimate reference point, enabling us to orient our lives in a way that leads to, their, to the fulfillment of their potential. Kaufman's theologically sound work for constructing a concept of God includes three mutually adjusting steps, or moments as he calls them, to signal that they can be used recursively. So here are the three moments of his theological methods in very broad strokes. Okay, moment one, construction of the concept world, which for Kaufman means a description of reality. And he leaves it open to us as to what approach we're going to take to describing that reality. Moment two is the construction of the concept God. Kaufman anticipates that individuals constructing a concept of God are likely to incorporate terms, concepts, and metaphors drawn from their relationships, everyday experiences, and familiar images, because this is how we relate to God most intimately. Though Kaufman makes allowances for this concept to include person-like person -like characteristics, he does not require them. So he really allows for a broad approach to how we're going to about constructing the concept of God. So this is a moment I focus on in my work and will focus on uh, in this paper. The moment three is adjustment of the concept world to ensure that, it, uh, that the reality unifies properly aligns with the concept God. Okay. In addition to these three moments, Kaufman's theological method places restrictions on concepts of God. So he tries both to allow maximum leeway in what we um, draw on from our own lives in constructing and our religious traditions and other um, components in constructing this concept, but then he's going to put moral restrictions on those concepts. Um, because these uh, restrictions he um, offers are needed since God, uh, our concepts of God serve as ultimate reference points. They orient our lives and thus have a direct bearing on the moral character of our lives and our ability to achieve what he calls human potential, our human potential. So important is God's role in transforming and correcting our lives that he writes, the problem of developing criteria for choosing among concepts of God is among the most difficult and urgent facing contemporary theology. Offering his own response to the problem he has noted, Kaufman develops universal moral pragmatic criteria to identify validly moral concepts of God and to correct those that are not. These criteria he calls together the criterion of humanization. The criterion of humanization is not limited to, uh, to concepts of God constructed using his own method, but is intended by Kaufman to be used to test all concepts of God regardless of their source. The criterion of humanization identifies humanizing concepts of God which since they orient and guide our lives are more likely to humanize us. For Kaufman, the terms humanize, humanization, and uh, humanizing refer to what he calls our full human potential, or what many more call human flourishing. What human flourishing entails, of course, is highly debated. I will return to that. Um, but Kaufman has his own understanding of humanization, which he describes, or human flourishing. For him, it means proper moral, moral orientation. It also means well-being and genuine fulfillment in loving and humane communities. Service to this kind of, uh, to a humanizing God, Kaufman insists, could well serve our further humanization in today's troubled world. The purpose of Kaufman's criterion of humanization then is to secure concepts of God that are conducive to human flourishing. 
If based on this criterion, a concept of God is found to promote human flourishing, so up here, then it is um, deemed a uh, proper concept of God. It is deemed uh, justifiable and good. By contrast, if a concept of God is found to undermine moral orientation, well-being, and genuine fulfillment in loving and humane com uh, communities, then it is deemed by Kaufman to um, be, it should be judged neg negatively. And it should be, our, that concept of God should be adjusted or corrected. The religious ethicist Max Stackhouse would endorse this view. He agrees with the modern era insight that ethics and theology are, an are analytically di distinct. But he argues that they're mutually supportive, even necessary to each other, and that as distinct disciplines, they can correct one another. Ethics is necessary, Stackhouse writes, to assess the assumptions and implications of every theologically approved practice and dogmatic claim. For him, ethics is indispensable in investigating the relative validity of various religious claims about how we should live in this life. For theists following Kaufman, concepts of God play a central role in the practical orientation of our lives. For this reason, regressive features of these concepts, including our own, need to be identified and rectified. Self-reflection on concepts of God cannot replace the kind of check offered by deliberations with others, nor can it replace the kind of checks offered by ethical norms that have been adjudicated in the public square. Indeed, Stackhouse maintains, and I'm going to quote here, valid ethical criteria find ultimate sanction in what is truly universal and enduring, as opposed to what is religiously and temporarily mine or ours at the moment. Without such critical principles, he adds, theological ethics is tempted to be little more than an idiosyncratic folkway and theology is tempted to be the ideological megaphone for what a group believes or practices. As Stackhouse insists must be the case, Coffin resists the moral relativism that considers all concepts of God morally equivalent or refuses to pronounce on their relative validity. Coffin is a proponent of evaluating concepts of God to ascertain whether they are validly normal, moral, as well as a proponent of um, non-relativistic moral <clears throat> norms. Though he does not use terms like globalization or contingency, Kaufman writes, the coming new age of a thoroughly interconnected and interdependent worldwide humanity must build upon the best insights and disciplines of all of our long and varied human experience as conserved for us in the many religious and cultural traditions alive and meaningful today. We must be open to all in conversation with all, but we must not be uncritically respect, uh, receptive to every claim that is made, whether by perspective strange to us or by the tradition we ourselves hold dear. Each must be examined and assessed in light of the criterion of humanization. Unfortunately, Kaufman's criterion of humanization is too vague to identify validly moral ultimate points of reference for which he's calling. His criterion of humanization is made up of basically two components. The first component amounts to little more than the requirement that concepts of God contribute to human flourishing as Kaufman defines it, and I had put the slide up earlier. The second component requires that concepts of God call, call into question all of our goals, projects, values, norms, compelling us to re-examine them in light of what counts as a humanized life. Such a sketchy criterion cannot accomplish the aims, 
Kaufman has in mind for his criterion. Problematic also is the source of the criterion of humanization. Kaufman argues that it reflects a notion of human flourishing shared by peoples all over the globe. However, he is the sole author of this criterion, leaving it open to charges of Eurocentrism and parochialism. Section four. Okay, it looks like I'm stuck. Okay, I'm stuck. All right, section four. I argue that in this age of globalization, a global ethic, like the parliament of the world's religions, global ethic, is needed to test concepts of God. Traditional ethics grew out of rigorous analysis and theorizing. However, leading approaches, according to political philosopher Will Kimlicka, confront unexpected difficulties when put in an increasingly global perspective. For this reason, Kimlicka writes, as globalization increases, ethics must itself become globalized. And I might add also help us to navigate increasing contingency. Globalization has widened the range of ethical challenges. When facing everyday moral decisions, for example, we must weigh issues such as terrorist threats, growing income disparity, the thinning of social nets, environmental degradation and climate change, rising ethnic conflicts, exploitation of illegal immigrants, the trafficking of women and children, just to name a few. If our approach to ethics must become globalized, as Kimlicka suggests, a trans-religious, transcultural ethic, in other words, a global ethic, is required to evaluate concepts of God. A global ethic would enable us to assess whether concepts of God provide theists with validly moral guidance when they face questions and dilemmas about how to respond in a more interdependent, interconnected, pluralistic, and contingent world. And if a global ethic is to avoid charges of Euro-American centrism and parochialism, it will ideally have undergone a vetting process that includes widespread public conversations between representatives of the world's religions and cultures. Nigel Dower, an academic philosopher and past president of the International Development Ethics Association, agrees. He writes, if a global ethic is an ethic widely shared across the world, then this global ethic will be the product of negotiation, consultation, and transnational dialogue. The sole global ethic currently in existence that is the product of significant negotiation, consultation, and transnational dialogue is a 1993 Parliament of the World Religions Declaration Toward a Global Ethic. So it is on this ethic that I will focus for the remainder of my talk. For brevity's sake, I will uh, from now on refer to the Declaration Toward a Global Ethic simply as the global ethic. All right, so the goal of the global ethic is to art articulate a fundamental consensus by the world's religious and cultural, cultural traditions on values, standards, and personal attitudes because a better global order cannot be created or enforced by laws, prescriptions, and conventions alone. The process of identifying these common moral norms and of articulating them in, a glo in the global ethic began in the early 1990s, when the Swiss Catholic theologian Hans Kuhn was asked by the council charged with preparations for the Parliament of the World Religions to draft a global ethic in time to present it to the representatives of the parliament when they gathered in Chicago in September 1993. Over a period of months, Kung developed a draft of the global ethic, seeking input from the, his extensive network of colleagues, 
and representative from the world's religions whom he sought out and consulted specifically for this project. Kung then sent the amended draft to the council in Chicago, whose members circulated further among scholars and leaders of the world's religious traditions. When the parliament finally convened, 5,500 representatives from 55 countries and 60 religious traditions attended. These representatives were given for their review and vote the final version of the global ethic. An overwhelming majority of delegates supported the text without change. The global ethic consists of four irrevocable, unconditional moral directives based on two fundamental commitments found in every religious and cultural tradition. These commitments are the golden rule and the demand that all human beings be treated humanely. The directives are deemed irrevocable in the sense that they represent concrete standards and unconditional in the sense that all human beings are called to hold firm to them. The four directives the global ethic acknowledges are often only implicit in the religious and cultural traditions and too often disregarded. Nonetheless, the global ethic asserts they are held in common across the globe. The directives contain no theological or religious language. This is quite intentional. Since the global ethic identifies moral norms that are shared by all the world's religious and cultural traditions, some of which are non-theistic, only cross-cultural concepts and terms are included in the global ethic. The absence of theological and religious language is also intended to allow the religious traditions to turn to their own resources, sacred texts, rituals, and symbols, to frame the directives in compelling and meaningful ways for adherence of their traditions. And I will say more about this feature um, in, in a little while. So, all right, back to stuck. All right, so here we have the four directives. First directive, commitment to a culture of nonviolence and respect for life. Two, commitment to a culture of solidarity and a just economic order. Three, commitment to a culture of tolerance and a life of truthfulness and for commitment to a culture of equal rights and partnership between men and women. And then the global ethic um, elaborates each of these four directives further. For example, under the first directive, the commitment to a culture of nonviolence and respect for life, there are five sub-directives, which are all people have a right to live, conflict should always be resolved nonviolently, young people must be taught nonviolence, Individuals must respect other species of living things. People must always be ready to help each other. If we parse the global ethics for directives and for directives, we find that um, the global ethic is grounded in several assumptions about the conditions of life that advance human flourishing. Humans flourish, the global ethic implies, in cultures that have a respect for life, including of other species, and in cultures that are committed to nonviolent conflict resolution, a just economic order, solidarity, helpfulness, tolerance, truthfulness, and equal rights and partnership between men and women. Okay, so that's its view of human, of human flourishing. In contrast, recall that for Kaufman, humanization or human flourishing means proper moral orientation, well-being, and genuine fulfillment in loving and humane communities. So I think we can see that the global ethics understanding of human flourishing is consistent with the much vaguer understanding of human flourishing in Kaufman's criterion of humanization. However, whereas the criterion's definition of human flourishing is too broad 
to serve as a test to identify validly moral concepts of God, the global ethics directives are specific enough to accomplish this task. Thus, I suggest that we can improve Kaufman's theological method by using the global ethic to test concepts of God. The validly moral concepts of God identified by the global ethic will qualify as humanizing concepts of God, capable of orienting our lives for the kind of flourishing Kaufman had in mind. More importantly, though, validly moral concepts of God identified by the global ethic will be concepts of God capable of orienting our lives toward the global ethics civic significantly more detailed understanding of human flourishing. The global ethics offers a set of directives that promote its particular understanding of human flourishing. But as I mentioned earlier, what constitutes human flourishing is a hotly debated issue. So how can we tell whether the global ethics directives actually promote human flourishing? How can we tell that its particular view of human flourishing is the correct one? So to, under, to um, answer this question, I'm going to propose cross-checking the global ethics understanding of human flourishing against the United Nations Development Program's understanding of human flourishing. So the metrics used by this UN agency to measure and track the multidimensionality of human well-being has emerged in part from its extensive studies of populations around the globe. As such, I argue that its metrics offer an empirical means of verifying the theoretical validity of the global ethic. All right, so section five of my paper. In this section, I describe the range of value goal norms used by the UN Development Program, the UNDP, to gauge human development or human flourishing. For the last three decades, the UN and UN associated bodies have invested a great deal of money and expertise on identifying the components of human flourishing and devising metrics to measure those components. In the early 1990s, the United Nations Developing Development Program, the UNDP, working closely with the Indian economist and philosopher Martya Sen and the Pakistani economist Mahub ul Hab, studied the link between economic growth and human development. Until then, economic growth had been treated by the UN as equivalent to human development. But it was becoming clear that economic growth, at least sometimes, increases human suffering or negatively impacts dimensions of human life associated with well-being. Since 1996, the UNDP has charted economic growth and human development separately. Currently, the UNDP characterizes human development with a different set of value goal norms than those used to measure economic growth. A comparison of human development's value goal norms with those of economic growth highlight the, highlights the important distinctions the UNDP makes between the two. Economic growth is evaluated based on nine value goal norms, and I'm just going to give you three out of the nine. So here's uh, three. One is dependable, dependable property rights. Two, a stable macroeconomic climate, meaning a stable social and political situation in the investment region. Three, a business climate that's attractive for investors. Human development, on the other hand, is measured by the UNDP using 29 different value goal norms. Okay, I'm going to give you nine that are representative. Okay, here are nine. So we have de democratic institutions, we have longevity, health, adequate nutrition, access to information and communication technology, gender-based equality, decent labor conditions, 
child protection, public accountability. Those are the nine out of the 29. Okay, if we compare the global ethics directives with the UNDP's value goal norms, this is what we get. So in orange is language that I pulled out of the global ethic. So I put that language underneath the nine um, value goal norms I provided out of the 29 used by the UNDP to measure human development or human flourishing. All right, so under democratic institutions, we see that we can uh, pull in solidarity and tolerance from the global ethic, equal rights and partnership between men and women, equal chance to reach full potential as a human being, a just social, a just social order. Okay, so we can see there's significant overlap between the two. The directives of the global ethic, which are the result of trans-religious, transcultural, and transnational conversation, compare favorably with the value goal norms of the UNDP, which are the result of global empirical studies. <laughs> that could be Hans Kuhn calling now. That would be interesting. Um, conducted by experts using transparent research methods. I think this favorable comparison between the two is especially significant because these two understandings of human flourishing were developed independently of each other, used dis using distinctly different approaches. Since the global ethics understanding of human flourishing cross-checks with the UNDP's understanding of human flourishing, we can conclude that the global ethic accurately captures the conditions of life best suited to human flourishing. Thus, we are justified. I claim that we, in, in using the global ethic and uh, considering it a valuable resource when seeking to identify which concepts of God qualify as validly moral because they promote human flourishing. The global ethics directives then are appropriate substitute for the criterion of humanization to go back to Kaufman um, for um, his criterion of humanization and his theological methods. But more importantly, in this age of globalization and contingency, the global ethics directives is an appropriate testing tool for any individual or group interested in identifying validly moral concepts of God. Now I want to acknowledge that um, there is critique on the part of moral particularists or contextualists about moral directives like those of a global ethic, um, in, to, in, this, the case, in this case today, the global ethic, or the value goal norms like those of the UNDP that claim to be shared universally. Moral contextualists reject claims that any single set of moral directives or value goal norms can apply to every person. For particularists, the global ethic proposed by the Parliament of the World Religions and the value goal norms of human development by the UNDP are problematic. It is the case that when assessing human flourishing, the UNDP relies on the same value goal norms regardless of geographical area, ethnicity, gender, class, religion, etc. In other words, UNDP makes no distinction between, say, human flourishing in France or in China or in Libya. Nor does it make a distinction between French Roman Catholic human flourishing or French Protestant human flourishing or French Jewish human flourishing or French Muslim human flourishing. And the UNDP would say there are good reasons for this lack of differentiation. Studies carried out by the UNDP have concluded that different kinds of societies do not produce different kinds of human beings. In other words, the world contains one kind of human being and flourishing takes the same basic form for everyone. 
It is also the case that based on multi-religious consultation, negotiation, and transnational dialogue, the developers and signatories of the global ethic agree that an ethic is shared by all religious and cultural traditions. Also based on academic research, global experts like Nigel Dower argue that a global moral community does exist and what is his evidence? Um, number one, across the world he finds that there's a certain level of agreement about core values and duties of mutual aid. I think the, the incident around the Malaysian airline showed how uh, nations um, that don't normally cooperate one another have actually worked together to try to locate this airplane in an unprecedented manner. Um, a number two um, of, of Dower's um, um, evidence is that within global organizations he finds that individuals have certain shared ideas which they work together to promote. So in other words, according to Dower, some individual states and global organizations already operate out of a shared set of values, duties, and ideas. I also want to point out that particularism carries its own risks. It is prone to underestimate the impact of exclusionary moral directives embedded in communal and cultural practices. But the global ethic avoids this risk because its directives already present in all religious and cultural traditions provide a basis for critique of exclusionary moral directives. At the same time, the global ethic avoids the risk of an abstract universalism that fails to take into account the religious and cultural traditions unique ways of negotiating questions about the meaning of life and death, the burden of suffering and the forgiveness of wrongdoing, the global ethic, empty of theological and religious language, respects the plurality, the plurality of moral practices that characterize religious and cultural contexts and gives each religious tradition the opportunity to turn to their particular resources, rituals, text symbols, to integrate the directives into its teachings in its own unique way. Finally, I offer some concluding remarks. We don't need to be familiar with demonstrations showing that philosophical proofs fail to demonstrate, to demonstrate God's existence to question what we can know about God's objective reality. Our awareness of the many live options that exist next to, our, next to our own set of beliefs and our awareness of the freedom we exercise in constructing our ideas about God have for us undermined our certainty in God's objective reality. This state of affairs can lead to an agnostic stance on the question of God's existence and to contingent faith in our subjective concepts of God. Nonetheless, the concept of God continues to serve as a profound symbol in our culture and cannot be set aside. A theological method like Gordon Kaufman's acknowledges the central role of concepts of God in orienting our lives. Kaufman's method is designed to help us construct concepts of God in ways that address the moral problems of our times and orient our lives accordingly. Since concepts of God as ultimate reference points provide us with moral guidance, the relevant question when assessing these concepts is whether they support human flourishing. Kaufman developed a criterion of humanization as a test to identify these concepts. Unfortunately, this concept, this criterion, is too vague to function as Kaufman desired. Since in theistic religious traditions, the concept of God is central to all theological claims, the discipline of ethics can help us identify validly moral concepts of God. A global ethic, however, is now called for, given the changes globalization and contingency have wrought on contemporary human life. A global ethic, such as a part 1993 Parliament of the World Religions Declaration toward a global ethic, can identify validly moral concepts of God 
and offer guidance for how to correct concepts that fall short. It is a strong candidate for this task because it arose out of a trans-religious, trans-cultural, and transnational conversation. In case of worries about whether the global ethic reflects a sound understanding of human flourishing, we are reassured by the fact that its directives correlate convincingly with the UNDP's human development value goal norms. As a result, we can have confidence that the global ethic promotes a kind of human flourishing that the UN and its associated agencies, like the UNDP, monitor and are actively promoting throughout the world. Thus, we may use the global ethics directives to test concepts of God, those concepts that satisfy the moral constraints imposed by the directives qualify as validly moral. Such concepts properly orient theists in day-to-day -day practical choices and provide ultimate moral reference points that are conducive to a flourishing life. Thank you, Miriam, for this rich paper, for inviting my response, and for organizing this wonderful conference. Your paper opens up a number of key issues about the relationship between God and morality that are still contentious, even as they are old. In my response, I would like to highlight a number of these issues to help guide our discussion. I first want to review the central argument, and because the paper is admirably clear, this will be brief. I then want to raise four questions I think her paper poses for us. So Miriam puts forth a bold argument that seeks to have theology and theological ethics respond to changing global dynamics. She argues that we need to undertake a twofold, mo twofold movement. On the one hand, we must revise our doctrine of God to ensure that the doctrine is validly moral. On the other hand, given the new global scope of understanding, our ethics themselves must be rethought. So we must both revise our doctrine of God in light of a newly revised ethics. Why should we undertake such a project? Taking an agnostic stance on the question of God's existence, Miriam argues from a purely practical basis. That is, because concepts of God do in fact influence how people behave morally, ethics must play a crucial role in identifying and providing correctives for potentially non-valid moral concepts of God. Because there are many ethical options on the contemporary scene, and because relativism leads to an undesirable consequences, a global ethic is needed to provide the appropriate groundings of moral, moral criteria. Drawing on Gordon Kaufman's project, she argues that humanization must be a criteria for the doctrine of God, but this criteria needs greater specificity, which she locates in the global ethic. In my response, I want to raise four questions for discussion, which I hope open up the claims at the heart of this argument. The first two are theological, the second two are ethical. And the first question I want to ask is a version of the Euthyphro question. Put in, put in the terms of this paper, what does the concept God add anything to the moral work that is being done by the global ethic? To get at this question, I think it will be useful to compare Miriam's project to Kant, a figure who stands in the background of her work. Miriam's project is importantly different than Kant's. For Kant, the concept of God is only warranted insofar as it is a necessary postulate of practical reason. It is important for Kant that God does not supply new moral laws nor does or should God serve as moral motivation. While the moral law is to be treated as if it were a command of the divine, for Kant, autonomy requires the law to be followed for its own sake. Rather, God is necessary for the highest good, the conjunction of virtue and happiness. The concept of God is simply a postulate of practical reason, and attributes of God are derived from this necessity. They're not open to criticism or imaginative reconstructions as such. For Miriam, on the contrary, there is no necessity, practical or otherwise, to the concept of God. The motivation for speech about God is purely practical. Because we do in fact make moral judgments based on our concepts of God, we should test whether the God concept is validly moral. But this is a different project. For Kant, we can only assign it to what is rationally necessary. Here we have more freedom in ascribing to God attributes which lead to humanization. This difference highlights, I think, what's at the core of her work. Miriam is speaking to concrete communities who in fact employ and continue to employ the concept God, while Kant is discussing the constraints of rationality. But if I may be so bold, Kant may protest here. 
Why do we need God for morality in this way? What is added to these humanizing goods by including the concept God? Why can't the goods stand on their own? Why not just clarify what we mean by humanization and leave this concept God out of the picture? Why invoke the difficult and the obscure for the relatively clear? And aren't we risking heteronomy of the moral by making God to be a moral motivation? And how free can we be in our discourses? And there may be uh, uh, ways to respond to these, particularly with the argument from Grace that Professor Hare raised, but I'll leave those aside for now. Second, I have a question on, on a concept you use. What does it mean for a concept of God to be validly moral? I think there are two ways to understand this claim, and there may be a tension between them. One way to understand this claim is to say that we can only say good things about God and nothing evil, so we can think of Socrates' critique of, of the Greek tragedians. A second way is to claim that the specific content we assign to the concept God is irrelevant. What matters is what ultimately leads humans to act morally, and there may be a tension between these two. So, for example, if we take morals to determine God, we want to say God is loving, God is kind, God is nice, whatever. Yet, this symbol may lead humans to becoming lazy or passive or inactive in their duties. On the other hand, a symbol of the harsh, angry judge may fail the humane picture of God, yet it may lead to more moral action. So, right, the, 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 uh, the harsh, evil deity of the Greek tragedians is supposed to invoke pity in the audience so they can uh, go out and be kind to each other, which may be more humane, even though the concept is morally ap appalling. So in the second case, God would not, it seemed, be validly moral, but the human actions would be. So which of these cases would count as a validly moral understanding of God? What is the key to the concept, moral concept of God? The concept or the human action that results? In a corollary here, I think most religious believers are at least not motivated by the concept God, but the idea of God as living. And if we don't start from an agnostic stance, but we take God as living, are we still able to judge God morally? Is there a tension here between the agnostic stance and the, the, the living religions. So two ethical questions, uh, which may be the same. First, what validates the normative claims of the global ethic or the parliament of world religions? The paper makes a number of claims about the validity of the global ethic being grounded in the consensus of the group. This is partially her critique of Kaufman. Even though the essay correctly identifies that a large delegation agreed to the document's values, we must still face the question of how universal this one particular group consensus can be. What normative authority does the council have? Or if we take our religious tradition more seriously than the council, why should this group of scholars count for more than what my tradition teaches if there's a tension between the two? I think there's two ways you can go about answering this. One would be to see the group as choosing norms, and hence consensus would be the value grounding moral law or, or the moral duties. A second way would be to have them recognizing good that's already exist. The authority would not be in the consensus, but in the reality to which they refer. And this gets to the last question. I have a question about the specific concrete norms articulated by the global ethic. Specifically, I'm interested in these values are supposed to be understood as representatives of religious traditions, or if they are normative for the traditions. Is the global ethic intended to speak from the traditions, or is it speaking to the traditions? And I think the fourth criteria is especially troublesome in this regard. Um, the, the, the fourth criteria is the claims that there's an equality between the sexes that all the religions teach. And Mary Daly's claim, right, shouts to the mind, like there's one religion, one world religion, and that's patriarchy. And even if we don't take Mary Daly seriously, it'd be a very difficult claim to make that the world religions have always been against patriarchy, right? So, so uh, if there's a tension between what the religious traditions have taught and what the, the global ethic is doing, how can we adjudicate this difference? What, again, is grounding the norms of, of, of uh, the global ethic? And how can we count this as a universal ethic if it seems, particularly here, that what the values are being articulated are Western liberal views instead of religious views? Or perhaps they're together, but... So finally, Miriam has provided us with a very stimulating paper that I've had the pleasure of reading over the last week. I'm thankful for the opportunity to read it and to respond to it, and I hope these comments will open up a lively discussion of her work.
absolutely crushing and depressing. <laughs> and uh, the reason was, I was unaware of this level of uh, agreement to universal moral uh, commonality on all these main, you know, all these things that you lay out, and that that compared, you know, an open question of religious emphasis, and then that that compared so closely with the secular ethical doctrine of the UN EP. Um, so then it seems to me that the world's morality is largely in agreement about a peaceful, just, equal world. And so I know I learned that. And I already knew that the world would be, you know, in some ways increasingly unjust, it's persistently violent, and it's, you know, uh, very unequal, both economically and increasingly so. So is your talk then what I'm interpreting as like a crushing indictment of the power of that? Since we, our morality is all sort of the same, and we all, or at least meaningfully the same, and we do the opposite consistently and universally, does that mean, like, are you, is the implication in that ethics just, is infinite? Or I, 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 would, I would go to Tim's comment about if you look at the history of Christianity and its treatment of the two genders, men and women. Um, how can you claim that in, embedded in Christianity is a notion that men and women are equal? Um, I think, though, that you can um, say, well, actually, Christianity over time has found resources from within itself to critique that um, assertion that women and men are not equal, and that um, a growing portion of the Christian tradition now supports, um, as, as without question, that men and women are equal. So, so ethics works slowly, but one can say that it it has found as um, the global ethic asserts resources from within each tradition to over time um, develop in a direction that's more aligned with what um, the global ethic paints, the picture it paints as human flourishing, as well as the picture that the UNDP is painting about what counts as human flourishing. So I, I don't, uh, Kaufman is actually worried about that kind of despair. And so where he's willing to, for himself, say how God is real to me, so he's actually describing his own subjective concept of God, is to see a force at work in this progression towards um, uh, communities that are looking more and more like those uh, dis that he described in his humanization, his, uh, that he, he wants to secure with the criteria of humanization, and that's likewise described by the global ethic and the human beings um, metrics. Um, he, he, like Khan, is very worried about despair and um, understands that God, and this goes back to one of Tim's comments as well, why do we need God at all? We know what, what an ethical life should look like, so who needs God? Um, I think that's what Stabcast is saying, is that there is a division between ethics and, um, and our concepts of God. Kant certainly said that. Uh, Kant um, felt that we would lose hope if we perceived that the sacrifices we made to live a, a a virtuous life did not bring down to equal levels of happiness. And since we couldn't observe that in this life, we had to postulate God in a, a soul so that we would continue to uh, be able to um, develop our moral capacities and be rewarded in appropriate measure by God with happiness. Um, 
Kaufman goes about this differently, but in that what he's looking at is the progression. So, oh yes, there's something we can hang on to. We can look at the past and see this progression and this we can call God, or he calls God. And so that gives me hope and um, assurance that my struggles in trying to live a moral life are, are, are playing out in a positive way. Not just for me, but globally, for the world. Um, even if I can't see its effects right now, uh, I can look at the past and I can see, I can see the progression. Oh uh, yes, so this is a point about Kant. Um, this was a very small part of your paper, and I think most of it will survive, um, even if this criticism is correct. Um, but I, I, I agree with Tim um, that it's misleading to think of Kant as saying there's no proof or disproof, and that we're left agnostic. Uh, for Kant, we don't have knowledge, but that because he has a very particular concept of knowledge. Uh, so uh, we don't have knowledge because God's not the sort of thing that we could perceive. But Kant thinks we do end up with justified true belief. We don't end up with agnosticism in the familiar sense. Uh, and I think you downplay Kant's sense of the objectivity of God's existence within practical reason. <coughs> Kant has different views over time on my reading. I focus more on his conversation about God in um, religion within the bounds of reason alone. Me too. Um, and my reading of that text is that he is making certain claims about God um, also in the lectures of philosophical theology, he actually says reasonably, reason can get us to these attributes of God. If God is reasonable, then my reason can tell me that I can ascribe these attributes to God. And this is so reasonable, of course, you could possibly disagree. On the other hand, he is also, in my view, um, being very intellectually honest in that I cannot prove this. You know, reason gets me here, and and I really convinced this is what God looks like. However, I, at the end of the day, if called a defendant, cannot. Uh, right. He has no proof within theoretical reason, but he has a defense, actually one on which he's willing to stake his life. Um, but I, we disagree. So yes, we do. <laughs> but, but I also don't think we need Kant to This project, this this paper is not grounded on Kant, so it doesn't it doesn't fall if we pull out that rug from underneath it. Thank yes. you. For the paper. Would the directives of the global ethic be valid even if no one at the parliament signed the document? In other words, is the validity of the ethics a validity of uh, majority of people. That is to say, it's a completely empirical consideration. And if folks didn't sign up, then those those directives would, in fact, not be morally valid. I think it's interesting that the global ethic finds support in the UNDP's global norms. And so, and so we have. We have the global ethic that's ratified. But even if we set that aside, we still have the, the UNDP's valuable norms, uh, which uh, I would find it hard to argue against those valuable norms. Yeah, I'm trying to push you a little bit on the extent to which you're really making an empirical argument. So let me try it this way. Uh -huh. would, it, would it be morally wrong for me to treat men and women as equal if that ran against the UN, the DP's concern about human flourishing. Yes. So there is no object, I mean, it may be a related question, there is no 
objective claim of human flourishing outside of what can be validated either through a consensus of religious people or through empirical research into what leads to physical flourishing. Which is fine. I'm just I, 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 know it's really, I know it's a really important discussion. Um, I would say that the UNDP has found that it can quite um, it can proceed in a very valuable and important way without answering that question. So I, I haven't felt the need to answer it either. And I don't think the uh, signatories of the global ethic that were concerned to answer that question either. Um, they felt that they were essentially articulating explicitly what's already implicit. So, uh, you're, the, everything you do makes me think of the concept overlapping consensus. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just surprised you haven't really used that uh, in some form. And I guess in, in terms of, um, you know, because I've been thinking in terms of the Kaufman thing, you know, there's always this overlapping consensus on quote unquote morals, but you know, whether uh, there can be a kind of overlapping consensus on sort of visions of the whole. Um, which is a little different, um, and, um, and you know, and just my final kind of part of this is that that makes me think of like, I, and forgive me for being so blunt on this, and I just don't know his work very well, but why do you even need him uh, in some sense, right? In the, in the sense that once you move the overlap of consensus, then you're in the sort of particular controls of God in the whole, um, and that's a that's a whole different direction. In some sense, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so my um, my dissertation actually takes on that question as well. Okay. These are two components. Yeah. And so the other component is exactly what you're talking about. So it's actually very rich in Kaufman also. Yeah. So that's why he's been a very interesting resource to me because mm -hmm. I'm interested in both questions. It turns out so is he. Um, unfortunately, I didn't. I didn't have enough time right. to discuss Kaufman today, so I focus on the ethics part of mm -hmm. his. Uh, but the, okay, the overlapping consensus thing, I mean, that, is, that, is that what you're doing, or is it, yeah, is that, you know? Um, do I want to bring in Walls and uh, his work on, I, I'm comfortable with how this work is spinning together at this point about bringing in Walls and some of the contested issues that he brings with him. Okay. Let's put it that way. I think there's enough contested issues going on right here to, without adding any more. Um, although I think I would find him a very uh, interesting resource. Even though they, they do fit in a, in a more 
I prefer to use the term objective only when I'm talking about the reality of God. And so, so I'm only using that language when I'm talking about uh, questions around God's existence. Uh, and uh, then talking about what we each believe. So I do focus on the individual in the sense of each of us has a concept of God just based on uh, the sense that I could go into a, any congregation on a Sunday or a Saturday or a Friday evening and pull each individual sitting in a pew and they would have a different understanding of what God is. Um, but where that um, then needs checked, Kaufman is saying, and, and Kant does too, is, is morally. That we can't reflect or that we can only go so far reflecting on whether our concepts are moral or not, mm -hmm. which is so important because those concepts are orienting us in our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's when we have to go further afield and we have to break open um, the conversation to that's often limited to ourselves and, and take it out to the public square and, and um, we see how it's going in interesting directions when that conversation involved the problem of the world. Thank you. 
emphasize a bit like objective and subject to the garden, and maybe even your Kantian position. Has, has that somehow been either drawn from explicitly or perhaps implicitly your you're much closer to Kaufman than you realize in terms of your um, understanding of Kant and also the understanding of these pathways. And whether you want to reject Kaufman, maybe it's fine, but it might help give consistency to some of your terminology if it's made clear how much you're actually relying on Kaufman for the discussion of constructions in terms of the body and humanization, because these seem to be things that are important for what you want to say about gender as well. Uh, okay, that's helpful. So I will. Okay, we can all Yes, I will. I can just like one that and see where that is moving from. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask this question. Um, so So God offers comfort, 
It depends on what you add to that construct. It can be very rich. So it can be a comforter, it can be um, uh, an instigator, it can be a subversive force, it can be um, mother, father, um, he, there are metaphors, he begins to reject like father or lord, um, becomes problematic, so he wants to, if you're going to keep those, you have to reinterpret them because he sees those as linked. Because of God's orienting power is linked to uh, negative effects on flourishing. So he begins to speak out against certain metaphors as well that he allows in that uh, wide open portion of his theological method where he you know, lets you bring in pretty much anything you want to bring with you, but then you have to take a look at it and see if it ends up validly moral, in which case you need to reevaluate. So that's the whole part from this conversation that's missing. So it looks like God's very thin here. But during the phase that I'm working on for Kaufman, he, he actually, God can be very, can be very rich, a very um, descriptive, very, um, in, in a great way, different metaphors that would come up, up for us individually and from within our tradition. Say something more about the relationship between conceptual understanding and ethical understanding. That is to say, how can our understanding of a certain concept of God, for example, be translated into an ethical understanding of how we ought to be? Mm -hmm. uh, because I take it that Hoffman is trying to construct the concept of God in order to justify uh, you know, our certain human conceptions of what it means to live a flourishing life. But it seems to me that it does not necessarily give us normative purchase. That is to say, on one hand, to justify something is to give reasons for why something is such and such. But it is not the same as to give directives for how to live our lives in such and such a manner. So, could you clarify the relationship between the conceptual understanding of justification and normativity on the other hand? There is no reason that you couldn't construct a purely conceptual concept of God that includes no normative dimension. Um, but because Kaufman is very concerned about the moral quality of our lives, he, he uh, integrates the normative dimension into the, the concept of God. Uh, I don't whether you would require that or not, I would say for Kaufman that was that was very important because for him that's an integral part of what the concept of God does is to orient our lives, including in the moral way. So I'm not sure uh, whether I answer your question or not. I think that's a kind of move that he's making. Um, and then and then how we integrated that normative us as being called to live that because and that's how that concept orients us is because we're called to live up to that normative dimension that's been integrated into the concept. I mean I, I guess uh, what came to my mind was something what Voltaire said that if God did not exist it would be necessary to invent him. So there's a sense in which Kaufman might be trying to construct a certain conception of God to justify what we already think is the right way to live, but I'm not sure if that is necessarily the same as obeying or having a certain standard and to obey and to abide by a standard and to live a certain form of life. But I guess I'm just trying to um, try to get a sense of the actual relationship you know, um, of what Kaufman is trying to do. Yeah. Well, and here, those reflections. Thank you very much. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts.
Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.